dozen companies in some of our University of Maryland centers, and I'm always energized. I may be the president of a university, but uh, I am still a practicing physician. I take care of children. And when I think back to what I knew 30 years ago, taking, back, taking care of children, and what the people in this arena have been able to bring to children and adults since, it's a revolution. And it makes a difference to my work. And it makes a difference to the satisfaction I take in my work as we bring these amazing discoveries to the bedside and to the office. That's what this final analysis is about. And I have the responsibility of introducing the University of Maryland Bulletin so let me just take a minute or two to do that. Uh, you need to know that we train the majority of Maryland's health professionals uh, across the professions. We treat over 100,000 patients a year. Uh, and we're also one of the top 10 public academic health centers in the United States for research. We have nearly 1,200 faculty who have received uh, in the past year about $600 million in extramural funding, more than $2 billion in the last four years in areas as divergent as cancer genomics, vaccine development, vascular biology, HIV AIDS, and regenerative medicine. But uh, education, clinical service research, still not enough. Uh, we're committed to being a global leader in collaborating with industry to bring those new discoveries that make a difference to my patients to market. Uh, we've just rewritten our tenure policy. People often ask me, does faculty care? They care about discovery, but do they care about rubbing shoulders in a place like this? Well, we've just rewritten our tenure policy to specifically reward faculty who are entrepreneurial. In the past year, our faculty conducted over 400 sponsored research projects and clinical trials with nearly 200 pharmaceutical and biotech companies around the world. Invention disclosures from our faculty grew by more than 40% last year. And our biopark, finally, and please come visit if you haven't, is a rapidly expanding center for innovation in the great city of Baltimore and the great state of Maryland. Maryland is a vibrant, innovative, exciting place to build a biotechnology company, and our University of Maryland is committed to helping you succeed. Now, I should stay for this panel, but I'm off to a business development meeting, which is what I think you want me to do. Mr. Secretary. Give him a round of applause. He leads one of the preeminent academic medical institutions and universities in the country. And I gotta tell you, I went to medical school there, and we didn't use to cross Martin Luther King Boulevard when I went to medical school there. Now hundreds of people cross Martin Luther King Boulevard for jobs, for opportunity, and it is a totally revitalized community. And that's not an easy thing to do, so give him a round of applause there.
it matters what we do in terms of the incentives and roadmaps that we put in place to encourage growth. I'm not going to talk here about everything that we're doing, because I'm going to be brief. Let me just take it up a notch and say, as a state, we're investing $1.3 billion into the life sciences. The Governor's Bio 2020 plan, we've already put a $400 million down payment on that vision and on that plan. Um, there's many specific things that have relevance. But for me, some of the things that have the most relevance is how do you build that continuum of capital where you can take innovation to, sorry, innovation and commercialization to company formation to life saving job creation. That's our biggest challenge. We put in place a number of different policies. The first thing that passed this session was Innovate Maryland. We're recognizing a lot of research is not ready for venture capital. But it's beyond research and has promise. We're going to make 40 to 50 small bets. But maybe five of them will work. Maybe 10 of them will work to get into a stage where they can get seed stage capital. That was passed this year. The biotech tax credit, $80 million invested so far into lives, into Maryland young companies. And we're very proud of that. Invest Maryland, which also passed, and we're getting ready to invest $84 million in venture capital into some of the most promising companies in the state. Now, the fact is that the U.S. Chamber of Commerce, which isn't always our greatest friend in rankings, they ranked us the other day, they ranked us last week, they looked at innovation and entrepreneurship as a result of the efforts that we've taken, and they called out Invest Maryland, they called out Innovate Maryland, they just ranked us number one in the country. Look, I want to thank you because most of those rankings, frankly, are all of you and companies that make it up. All that we're doing as a state is trying to create the best environment for you all to be successful. So thank you for everything that you do. If you have ideas, if you have suggestions, competition means always evolving, and that means also evolving policy to better and better policy. So we are not static. We're moving forward. We welcome those ideas, and thank you all for being here today. Secretary Johnson, and I guess uh, indirectly by Governor O'Malley of the state of Maryland, is to showcase and tell a couple of stories about a few of the companies who are part of the cluster that is currently the University of Maryland Biopark. So with great, great pleasure, I'm going to introduce three of our partners. I'm going to ask each of you, if you will, a little description of your companies, of yourselves, your own personal history, and then I'm going to ask you a question right now that you may be incorporated in. Why is your company in Maryland? And if you want to tell us why you personally are here, that's great too. But let's take it from the top. Ken Malone is a new CEO operating in the state of Maryland. He has brought his company, Ablatech, I guess about three months ago. The last one? Oh my goodness. <laughs> so, almost six months ago to the University of Maryland Biopark. Uh, I'm not going to steal his thunder, I'm just going to tell you he's co founder. President, CEO of what is one of the states and the world's most promising biotech companies, and certainly fits the description that Christian just gave of why we have this uh, wonderful signature of innovation and this wonderful, wonderful potential to continue as a leader in biotech. Okay. Sure, thank you. Thank you, Jane. Uh, let me first start off by telling you a little bit about. Appetite. And in order to do that, I, I got I to gotta take you to a little dark place for a second. So kind of end with me as we go there. And I promise you it will be a lot more uh, upbeat after. But I, I need you to take a second to think about cancer. And, and I need you to think about cancer patients and cancer therapies. And it brings out the incredible compassion in, in every human being to think about cancer patient and the way the body is ravaged, not just by the disease, but often by the treatment. Many even more so by the treatment of the disease. And, and I feel that, that compassion too, but more than that compassion, I feel this incredible passion. 
I feel this passion because I know that for two decades, the silver bullet for cancer has been sitting on the shelves of pharmaceutical companies, of government labs, of universities, University of Maryland. Hundreds of these silver bullets. The problem is, nobody's built the gun. We're building the gun. You see, the silver bullet are these little snippets of genetic information called silence and RNA. If you get it inside the cancer cell, you can turn it off. If you get it inside the healthy cell, nothing happens. Imagine chemotherapy with no harmful side effects. The key is getting the silence and RNA past your body's natural defense system has been an overwhelming task. Your white blood cells, your liver, your enzymes, your blood, blow it apart in a matter of seconds. Well, we've come up with a method in our laboratory of protecting it in its serum for 72 hours, of getting it into pancreatic cancer, bladder cancer, brain cancer, many other diseases, not just limited to cancer, and turning them all off. So that's all great. You have to get it from this laboratory work into working in animals and eventually into humans, and thus our challenge. And this is the reason why we are located at the University of Maryland Biopark. So for years we developed this technology and we decided we needed to have a great location. We started looking for where we were going to be. And it was a hands down easy decision. First we met Jane, who told me I had to be there. And I said, yes ma'am. But the biggest reasons have to do with what Dr. Berman discussed before. World-class research with an attitude of we want to work with you. Now remember, I told you we have a platform for delivering the science and RNA, and that the universities and government labs and pharmaceutical companies have the RNA that needs to be delivered. There are incredible partnerships to be had at all of the universities in America, but especially the attitude and the method by which the University of Maryland approaches working with companies like mine makes the decision easy. A couple of other things that have made it a good decision for us to be in the building. One is the, the pathways of funding that uh, the Secretary discussed. So these are big challenges. You don't get venture capital at the stage of my it's, it's not a discussion. You have to go after alternative funding, and most of that comes from the federal government. Yeah. In Baltimore, we're right down the street, basically, from the National Institute of Health and all of these other funding sources. And for us, the most important source for Dietrich, where we get the majority of our funding from uh, U.S. Army Medical Research. So, a big part of why we're located here was proximity to really great funding sources and partnerships with those sources to develop the technology for the yeah. Finally, Maryland has put in place, I think, the best total set of incentive factors in terms of the way that investor tax breaks are there, in terms of the way that uh, you have a variety of different funding programs for early stage companies. Would we like more of this point of lot but the total system, the total structure is really good in place, and it makes it an easy decision for us to be here. Now, having been here for six months, I can tell you that there were a couple of surprises, and they were all good surprises. Right? One is we didn't really understand just how incredibly good all of the resources were for support in our young little. So we have an agency of using instrumentation that we could never in our wild experience imagine spending money on. And it's just inexpensive, it's often almost free. So we really appreciate that as one of the things. And then the other thing that we really didn't realize was this idea of community of organization. And that has been an exceptional thing. My colleagues up here and many other people in the Bible, the, the number of projects and things that we do together, both just simply the victory and making sure we have a shoulder to cry on the page, but um, but also to get the specific projects and sharing resources. You know, uh, we constantly have people from other companies hanging out on that, hanging out of various 
that's been the most and what we have considered in the first few years. So uh, I think I've probably exhausted my time and get it off to somebody else. <laughs> so here we go. George Stetsky. George is the Vice President for Business Development at Shinokan Biomedical. This is a Japanese-owned company. Um, our facility is part of uh, the operation of the largest publicly traded uh, CRO in Japan. But the real signature for SNBL, they are the very first company to move into the university's biopark. So in 2005, when we opened our first building with the strong commitment of Chairperson Dr. Regatta of SNBL, we welcome you again. We continue to take such pride in the great work that you're doing and in all of the wonderful business partners you bring into the park every day. Services. He'll talk about that. I'll talk about Jeff. Jeff is a spectacular business development guy. We were building the first building at the Bio Park in 2005. Jeff called me, came over, sat down, learned what we were trying to do. We tried to figure out how to get this new, somewhat new company that you had started in. Couldn't do it then. Stayed in contact and just to our, just my honor. 
Uh, Vigilant came into the bio park this past winter, took significant space in 801 West Baltimore, our second multi-tier building. So we really, this guy is a achiever and he's a stick to it guy, and my pleasure to introduce Jeff Lyon. Um, she was the first meeting that I had when I joined um, Regional Vital Services and Quality Solutions. So I'll explain the two in a second. Um, but when we met, we talked about the biopark and this vision of the biopark. And I think the biopark is really just representing what's happening and what's happening and what will continue to happen in the state of Maryland. The potential we saw at that meeting, we tracked that potential and saw some of those projects and tenants that Jane was talking to. Uh, some of those businesses realize uh, by moving into Biopark, by creating this vibrant community that everyone's talking about. We're a little bit different in the sense that we are a service provider. So we are not developing drugs, we are not developing new technologies, but we are supporting companies and their needs in order to achieve their goals so they can focus on science. Vision of Bioservices is a biomaterial storage compliance uh, facility. So uh, we store critical materials in the biotech industry for pharma, uh, store just about anything, um, that requires uh, the type of infrastructure, both regulatory and bricks and mortar, uh, necessary to maintain those critical materials. Um, we have uh, several different temperatures, a variety of different temperatures where we can store materials for clients that are mainly manufactured products. So for a company like that to be able to jump into the biopark um, really shows that we believe in the leadership of the biopark, the university, to really focus on commercialization. That was critical for us. So those companies would need us unless they had a need for that FDA registered tissue bank, GMP validated facility. So that was, that was critical for us in order to be able to build our sister company, Quality Solutions, is a GMP validation shop. So, once again, if a company is manufacturing and they're entering into the first phases, phase one, phase two, they need that support in terms of validating their equipment, their processes, their facility. Um, and once again, you don't need that unless you're really dedicated and committed to commercialization. So, what I take away, I, I, everybody's kind of said it before, but uh, you know, Maryland is location, 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 and potential, potential, potential. We um, select the park also because of its proximity to BWI. We assist companies in their cold chain um, solutions. Shipping is very important to us. So at, at having BWI in the neighborhood, uh, having Rockaway on the road, having a, a long list of uh, potential clients and existing clients in Maryland helped. Um, but the potential is really something that we track and watch we very excited to be a part of that. So as more and more companies come into the biopark that are working towards commercialization, we feel that we can play a critical role in helping them develop. Thank you. Thank you all very much. Uh, I'd like to introduce a couple other members of sort of the biopark team because we really all work together every minute of the day uh, trying to build this thing. So uh, Nick Kassar is our director of marketing, senior VP. Yes, Calgar is a star uh, in our University of Maryland Office of Technology Transfer. Nancy, people be coming all day, talking to me because they find that they were looking for you. So I got a bundle of cards for you. Uh, Dr. Kathleen Norris runs the Baltimore City Community College Life Sciences Institute at the Biopark. Critical piece of workforce development, and Kathleen, Dr. Norris has become a critical member of our client recruitment team because she can immediately offer customized workforce training for whatever a company needs, be it one person or a thousand. We're still waiting for the thousand. So thank you, Dr. Norris. And then Dr. Steve Hansen is Senior Vice President at Rexford Science and Technology. We would have no park without our buildings. Steve Hansen has built buildings that every day deliver for companies like our panelists and for companies we're talking to for the future. Steve, thank you so very much. So we got a great crowd over in West Baltimore. And Dr. Robolato, our Director of Technology Transfer at the University of Baltimore, just sort of appeared after the panel, but welcome, Phil. <laughs> I, I just want to offer one other thing. We want to wrap this up. We've got a lot to do. But I'd offer one 
minute of closing comments and then let the secretary who will be so kind to close. Close, close, close. Um, I just want to echo the sentiments that everyone has talked about here before. We're, we're really proud to be a part of the Park, and, and the sense of community is something that I don't, you might not make the decision on where you go just for that, but just being able to get downstairs and have lunch with folks, to be able to talk about the contact management system that you're using. Um, you know, it, it's hard to place a value on that, but some days, i got to tell you, when you go down there, you're having a rough day, and you just see Ben's colleague Nick at the, at the cafe and say, man, I'm just having a rough day. This is why having someone to talk to really can make a big difference. I know it's an intangible, but it is something that, that has to be developed. It doesn't just happen. The, the leadership of the park, uh, the leadership has made sure that that, that community uh, has developed. And we rely on it, so it's, it's very important. I guess we'll all have to keep the dean myself, but it is an awesome environment for science. The access to the knowledge, there's financial support uh, from the state facility, and also uh, just the to get that business that we want to do in our final part is awesome. Jim, you're always there, so we appreciate it. Uh, I guess uh, I would add uh, that, uh, first off, great for the capital. We've got an intern. We appreciate that. Uh, it's been the easiest hiring environment I've ever had in my life. Uh, people keep knocking on my door and they want to hire more things. So uh, that's, uh, that's a great problem to have. And, uh, one that I think is also quite a I was just going to say, when I said he's leaving in, I don't know what else is left to say. But, 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 no. But, but, no. Hey, we're on the same page on that. In, in, in all seriousness, um, you say, Marilyn, we're serious about life sciences. We're serious about biotech. We are making the investment to put the money where I'm at. And, uh, you know, if you look at Biopark, we're investors in it. We want to be investors in great businesses. We want to be supportive. Please don't hesitate to reach out to any one of us. And I just want to you know, have anybody who's affiliated with the state uh, or the Department of Business and Economic Development, they can raise their hands who are here, the Judy Brits who heads the Maryland Biotechnology Center and other members of the team. Please don't hesitate to seek them out. We're here for you. And Maryland wants to be here for you. So thank you all for being here today. I close with one comment. Please come see us. That's Baltimore Street in Baltimore City. I miss at the Bio Park. Get to know our companies, see what you can do with them. We'd love to see each and every one of you there right after this meeting. So we'll see you next week. Thank you.